This week, the Laura Flanders Show comes from Whitaker, North Carolina, and the annual gathering of the Southern Movement Assemblies, a living experiment in popular democracy and local self-governance. Plantation politics, monopoly capitalism, incarceration instead of peace, a lot of the worst of the U.S. experience has its roots in the South, but so too much of the best from slave revolts to abolition to organized labor and civil rights. If the country goes as the South goes, what grassroots progressives do here matters. That's why we're here this week. For today's special, we partnered with Project South, an anchor organization of the Southern Movement Assemblies. They would join with me in saying welcome to the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. This week, from the U.S. South, the birthplace of so much of our economics and governance system in the United States, could the alternatives to those systems be emerging? It's just possible. This week, we come to you from Whitaker, North Carolina, in a special co-production with Project South, an anchor organization of the Southern Movement Assemblies. And I'm joined by Lady Mansfield. Lady, you want to introduce yourself? Right. Thanks, Laura. Hey, everyone. So, yes, I'm Lady. I work with Project South, as Laura said, Anchor Org of the Southern Movement Assembly, and I'm the founder of Hello Racism, both based out of Atlanta. Well, you know, it's so great to be here because if you look at so much of the image of the South, we hear about the disparities, the displacement, the dispossession, really, of the people. And yet at the same time, I've always said that the organizing that's happening here has lessons to teach the country and the world, and especially right now with the Southern Movement Assembly that is happening all around us. Do you want to tell people a little bit about what the Southern Movement Assembly is and why it is significant? The Southern Movement Assembly is a... Um is a practice of organizing tools in Texas that has historically come out of the South, from people in the South. So the Southern Movement Assembly was born out of the U.S. Social Forum, which I know you were. We were there. <laughs> a part of that was in Atlanta, Georgia in 2007. And so after that, or during that time, there were a lot of folks that were from the South at the U.S. Social Forum that realized that um, it was critical to really look at um, a movement formation that would bring the South, all of the Southern states together. And that got even broader by looking at global South. Mm. So not just the US South as we know it, but what does it mean to also look at the Caribbeans and say, what does organizing look like from that? So the Southern Movement Assembly is a collection of different folks and organizations from across the South, that's 13 states, includes Mexico, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. And this has been going on for years now. We're in at SMA 7, seven years of work. Maybe you could do us the favor of giving us some sense of who it is we're going to be hearing from in the show, who we're going to be interviewing. So we're going to be hearing from uh, several people that have been a part of the SMA process, that's been a part of designing it and making it happen, that are on the front lines of their issues. So we're going to hear um, things around environmental issues, the labor movement, uh, climate justice and what's going on right now around that. We're going to hear about uh, political education and the amazing political education that's offered as a tool and resource throughout the South. And we're gonna hear about the global movement work. So how are we connecting here from North Carolina to the Congo? And we'll hear about all that amazing work, people from it and those representing it here at SMA. Kicking us off though, Ashley Henderson. Ashley is the new executive director of the Highlander Center, the famed civil rights school and a whole lot more. Here's Ashley. talks about itself as being a catalyst for movement but not movement right and so 
I've spent like the last year really deeply listening to people. That's what Highlander does really well is we bring people together to deeply listen and then come up with what we should be doing based on that listening, that new knowledge that we've learned uh, through listening. And so I think what Highlander has been able to do consistently for 85 years is get people in a room that would naturally be in a room together probably and get them to listen to each other for real. And then based on the knowledge that they've got, not just be smarter people, right? That's not what popular education is. Um, but it's become smarter people to build new knowledge to transform your, your material conditions, right? Um, and I think that we've seen the impact of that across front lines. We've always pushed, Highlanders always pushed social movements in the South and across the world to really think about what's transformative and not just what we'll concede to and reform. Um, and I think that's what the assembly creates space for people to envision. Um, how we're doing that right now is through social, building social solidarity economies. There's a whole plank of the Southern People's Initiative that came from pre previous assemblies around economy. Um, we're doing movement accompaniment and support. Southern Movement Assembly is perfect for, for that work, right? It literally is grassroots folks coming together to figure out how they can work together to solve the problems in their communities that are plaguing them and build alternatives so that they never have to experience those harms again. What we've been able to do, even in the, the what, like 12, 24 hours that we've been here um, and the, building the Southern Village is actually practice that, right? It's like, uh, uh, it's true that like we as people who believe deeply in social justice want to practice what liberation feel like, feels like in lifetime. But I think what's also real is oppression doesn't disappear just because we're good people that love justice, right? Um, and so I think we've literally had to like come to some agreement about like what does governance that feels good to each other where everybody gets to live into their fullest dignity feels like. And to be doing that in a place like the Franklinton Center with such a rich history, um, both that's really beautiful and transformative and that's really hurtful and painful and traumatic is like a social experiment in building movement and freedom and how to govern that I think I think everybody across the United States needs to needs to get to get a taste of. We literally, the capital that we've got, as gross as this sounds, is in relationships and kinship. Um, and so we build that kinship and because of that we're transformed in the service of the work. But the infrastructure that we're building isn't just so people have more like access and proximity to power, that actually that building of, a, of relationships creates a social safety net that the state can't take away from us. And because we're in those relationships, we can move in moments of crisis in ways that other people can't. I take very seriously that I think organizing the South saves the country. I don't think that, you know, um, as goes the South, so goes the nation is a, an opinion. I think it's a fundamental fact. I think that many of us, especially in this sort of assembly process, feel really excited about sharing the lessons that we're learning with folks so they can experiment with building the participatory democracy that we've been experimenting with for a really long time. The Southern Movement Assembly is comprised of 35 or more organizations from across the U.S. South. There's the Greater Assembly, um, the General Assembly body, um, and then there's the Governance Council, right? And the Governance Council is sort of a, a decision-making body for coordinating efforts of the General Assembly. And typically, for the Southern Movement Assembly, uh, we have an annual meeting. Um, we've had six years of seven gatherings. Um, this is the seventh gathering. We're at Bricks here in Whitaker, North Carolina. And um, a part of the, the, the structure allows us to pull in folks from the General Assembly um, uh, along seven to eight front lines. Um, and according to those front lines, folks facilitate conversations about those front lines, um, prompting questions about uh, what's the landscape, uh, what are folks dealing with in terms of oppression and suppression. And then we look at um, actionable uh, agendas or create strategic plans to combat those um, oppressive agendas. So when we typically arrive um, at our site, um, we converge on that site, uh, all of our groups, those front lines from across the region. Um, and then we begin to, um, based on the agenda that we've um, established leading in, work that agenda throughout the weekend, right? And so typically um, we have a morning session where it's skill building session for all of assembly members, right? Sharpening our skills, picking up new tools and best practices. Then we move into the frontline assemblies where it's more issue based um, along the lines of climate change, democracy, people's democracy, um, workers' rights, et cetera. 
And so the next day we do another skill building session and then we fall into a bigger, um, the full uh, assembly process where all of those front lines converge, they share ideas, they come out of their synthesis, and then we begin to think about how can we collectively work across the region to carry out some of these efforts. And so the, from the general assembly process, we synthesize all of that information, the synthesis team, um, and then we meet um, the following day um, to break down and unpack all of the rich information that we've um, gathered. And from there, uh, the general council meets and to, to make decisions about how we're gonna coordinate these actions throughout the year, right? And once the council meets post-assembly, then we have our general membership calls. And from those, on those calls, the general members get to hear that what they said throughout the weekend through that synthesis process. And then from there, we begin to calendar throughout the year how we're gonna carry out uh, much of those efforts. Uh, in terms of that, the communications infrastructure, keeping all of those folks together, um, since 2012, we've had Monday calls um, that's coordinated by the Governance Council, sort of keeping um, the core group together. Um, and we also instituted monthly general membership calls um, that allow for the greater assembly to sort of hear where we are keeping track on those agenda items that we set at the last assembly process. I said the bread ain't gonna rise unless you put it in the oven. It's the civil rap move. I hope it reaches to my cousin. Said I'm talking to my sister. I'm talking to my brother. See, things will not change. Should we look the at SMA what SMA really developed out of our experience seeing what wasn't available in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and the Gulf Coast disaster, we saw that there was no mechanism for social movements to come together, make decisions, and then implement those decisions in, uh, at the scale that was necessary to respond to that level of disaster. And so we kind of made co commitments to ourselves as relatively young organizers back in 2005 that part of our generational struggle was to figure out this question of movement governance and how can social movements come together, make decisions, and implement those decisions on a scale commensurate to the level of disaster and crisis that we're, we're facing. Part of the process that needs to be front and center within the Southern Movement Assembly is to connect with our brothers and sisters in the global south because there's so much shared um, cultural foundations but also shared uh, struggles uh, and, and, and so we can use that to build not only grassroots power in the U.S. South but grassroots social movement power globally. What resonates for, for me is that, is that idea that uh, we can no longer wait until the state uh, came and do all, all, everything for us, you know. We, we must be able to build a civil society which is proactive and which can find solution for our own problem in our own environment. In, in Lucha movement, we, we, we don't have any single leader. We have a core team which is kind of um, playing a strategic role on the movement, but the, 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 the leadership is like a flat leadership. It's spread among many cells and many people. What Lucha is doing is um, by, by educating people, we are um, trying to end that feeling of powerlessness. We are working on founding our own solution we are holding them accountable for what they are doing and what they are not doing. And we are make sure that they understand that if they don't do what they have to do, we will use our citizen power to make sure that they will face their responsibility and, and through election or through a mass demonstration that they will, uh, they, we will hold them accountable for their actions. Part of our struggle, certainly with Project South, has been uh, trying to connect to what we call the black radical traditions of the U.S. South. And we think now, because of what's happening globally, that history is very, very important to tap into today. Both the, the idea of petitioning authorities for redress or, or, um, or change, 
but also maybe even more importantly, creating what we need at the grassroots and providing that change for ourselves. Something to apply to the life. That's why we teach them right. We teach them to read. We teach them to write. We teach them to believe. I grew up before integration, so I grew up in the segregated South. For me, when I look at life then and life now, I feel like what we had before integration was a lot better than what we have now. You know, a lot of the things that we had as communities, the unity, the connectedness, the taking care of one another, you could say we were more like a cooperative kind of community where everybody shared, you know, whatever we had, we shared it with one another. Nobody went without because somebody in the community always had what you didn't have and was willing to share it. I come out of uh, both, you know, the Black Liberation Movement and the Workers' Movement, but always had a view that the South represented something very special in the national and the global economy. You know, coming from the North and having some experience and some organizing, you can tend to uh, think uh, there's no experience here or that everything is slow. I mean, I've learned, you know, uh, quite a bit uh, uh, in, in, in here in North Carolina. And uh, I don't know whether it was Naima or a relative says, you know, I could tell you, you wasn't raised here because, you know, if you plant a tomato, you're waiting for the whole tomato to pop up. And when the thing, when, when the stem breaks through it, you're gonna say, that ain't what I'm looking for. And you might, might kick that away and, you know, but it, it requires, you know, a time and uh, and re, 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 replanting it somewhere and making sure that the sun is hitting it. And so uh, this question about organization and building a movement, you know, requires more than just a calling a, a, a demonstration, although that's an aspect of it. But these long-term relationships is a lesson from the old that the new has to, has to embrace. Our focus was to build organization uh, at the workplace based on what we call the centrality of black workers. Organizations fighting around issues individually don't constitute the power, you know, the social movement power that's, that's needed, you know. Uh, I think that, that, that there needs to be a greater understanding of the role of the South and the U.S. in the global economy. We need a Southern Workers' Congress, for example, so we can come together, you know, as workers in the South and working class communities in the South, and to begin to talk about how we're gonna organize labor uh, in, in here and what, what demands in the South what we're gonna try to place on capital. The Southern Movement Assembly is moving in the direction of what we need. Let me establish that. I work with the most impacted communities. It's where we call it the dumping grounds. In Eastern North Carolina, it's really the dumping grounds for the state of North Carolina. It's whatever white people don't want in their backyards, we find it in our communities. We believe that people is our greatest resource. That's who we need to be protecting. And nobody should be forced to live in the conditions that we're finding. What we need in the environmental justice movement is for people outside of the, you know, the impacted areas to become more aware uh, and informed about what is happening in these small areas, in particular in the rural areas of America. Naima and I, we talk about this, you know, constantly. You know, we can be, we can be pulled in uh, to uh, a struggle, and we have not yet defined what we want. It's not what we don't want, what we want, you understand? We, we, we know we don't want to live like hell, but we're, we're, we, 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 we are, are saying we want to live with dignity, but we're not defining the what? terms of dignity is. And so uh, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, our appeal, you know, is for others to care about us. But, but these uh, uh, relationships, we have to 
constantly analyze, you know, or what impact do these feelings, do these relationships really have on changing, changing our situation. This movement, although sometimes there are experiments that are happening within the movement because we're learning together, this is not an experiment. We have a belief in the world that we want, that we deserve to live in. We are practicing, the thing I love about the SMA is that we are practicing that belief every single step of the way. Spirit House is a black women-led grassroots cultural arts and organizing organization based out of Durham, North Carolina. We work around issues that impact um, the African-American community related to basically from racism on, right? So what are all of the things that impact us because of racism and white supremacy, like poverty, um, like multiple forms of discrimination, um, and uh, mass incarceration and criminalization. How do these things impact us? And then what are the things that we need to do to get through to our liberation? We have a performance piece that we do. Um, we seldom call it a play because it's directly about people's lives and our, our personal lives. Don't, don't, don't speak. Don't, don't reach. reach. No, no such thing as routine. Lower, Lower my, my eyes. eyes. Lower my voice. Life or death, I have no choice. We invite folks to engage with us during performance. We um, typically take people through like songs and like, and it, it, how do you use your culture to leverage um, the work is essentially the question for us. What does your vision for liberation look like? And how can we move that from like a vision board to like talking about public policy? like? How do you constantly have that back and forth? Because I think art creates this space where people can feel things out versus just intellectualizing them. And that's what some of the work looks like. It's like, so can you imagine a world without prisons? And if you can imagine it, what are, what are the steps to get us towards that kind of liberation? <laughs> There's a certain way Southern folks have moved um, traditionally when it comes to oppression. There's been this tradition um, that just feels sometimes intrinsically different um, from how I've seen other organizing spaces move. When the South is like the bed of not getting enough resources, um, where you can do an action but you might get followed home and they still burn cr crosses and all of this other stuff, you have to take into account how the South moves and so we move in a very particular kind of way. Um, and so like honoring and lifting that kind of culture about like, first we're gonna share a meal, first I'm gonna to get to know you, first we're gonna build some accountability with each other before I can actually trust that we can move any kind of real work. What we understand as SMA is that these are, this is where the real Southern work is happening and that this is where the real movement is if we find a way to bring people together. This process is a process of building um, on the year before, on the years before, in addition to welcoming, and that is Southern, to welcoming new people in with open arms and saying, you're home, you're welcome. Um, and I believe that it's a model, um, it's, I know that it's a model um, for movement across the country and folks forget to acknowledge that so many movements did start um, in the South. Something that's really unique about this particular um, scenario of this SMA, about being here at the Franklin Center Center at Bricks, is that, yeah, this was one of the worst plantations in North Carolina. Um, it's where folks were brought to be broken. There's cotton fields literally on both sides. Some people have never even seen like cotton when it's like in its raw format, right? And it's a visceral thing for some people who are like, watching little kids run in cotton fields, like just full of joy. And so what does it mean to like recode some of the things that are in some of our DNA around like how harmful a place like this could be? 
And so to gather folks who are um, having conversations around what does it mean to build a mutual aid liberation center? Mm -hmm. How do we um, abolish prisons? What does it mean to have um, clean drinking water in some of our locations? What does it mean to have clean air and also be in a place like this? Where for the folks who were enslaved here, that kind of vision, that kind of image of like kids running carefree through cotton fields probably was never a possibility. And I think it's really important to be here in a place like this because we get to use that lesson. Like if we're talking about transforming um, our institutions so they're no longer harmful, so they actually are meeting the needs of the folks that they think they're serving, what would that process look like? And I think for folks who are movement minded who are here, um, who gathered up trying to figure out how to build their own institutions, this is a really great lesson. Half of the work for us is like actually telling this really beautiful, brilliant story of our win. And I think a place like this is a place where people can actually imagine that because it happened. We teach them to believe, we teach them to rise, and my people gonna achieve, cause my people gonna fight, and our kids are gonna lead if we lead our children right. So we teach them how to learn when we use it what they like. So I just use a nice flow to show them how it might go if we teach it different. Thanks for watching. You can catch The Laura Flanders Show every week on this channel and online on our YouTube channel. You can also subscribe to the audio podcast. If you think we can do this without you, you're wrong. We need and depend on your support. Become a subscriber. Join this project. And we'll be back with you next time. Thanks. Mm -hmm.